Thank you. Thank you for your introduction, Pamela. It's an honor to be part of the uh, Studio School Lecture Series. Though imagination has been an important part of the creative process throughout art history, it's clear some artists draw on imagination more heavily than others, making scenes of the non-existent, giving form to dreams, memories, or fantasies, is a creative strain in painting embodied by the chimerical artworks of Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Bruegel, Schoengauer's precisely rendered demons and griffins, and Goya's painterly nightmares. The Italian metaphysical painters made dreamscapes, and the surrealists painted, according to Breton, quote, pure psychic automatism to express the real functioning of thought. Delacroix and Rousseau envisioned exotic lands. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel discussion, Territory of the Imagination, featuring three accomplished artists updating this rich tradition. Jules de Ballancourt was born in Paris. He received his BFA from California College of Arts and Crafts and his MFA from Hunter College. He's exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art, PS1, the Brooklyn Museum, the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Mass MoCA, Macro Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome, White Columns, Palais de Tokyo, Paris, and the Guggenheim Bilbao in Spain. His work is currently the subject of a retrospective in Montreal at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. A profile in Vanity Fair characterized the artist this way. Using the American landscape, social, political, and physical as his doorway to bigger themes, such as utopias and failed utopias, de Ballancourt has emerged as a bit of an art world Thomas Paine, tapping into the zeitgeist with an intriguingly varied body of work. De Ballancourt is represented by Gallery Thaddeus Ropak in Paris, Victoria Miro in London, and Salon 94 here in New York. Julie Heffernan received her BFA from University of California, Santa Cruz, and her MFA from Yale. During her formative years, she traveled to West Berlin on a Fulbright Hayes grant and attended Skowhegan. She's represented by PPOW Gallery here in New York, Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco, and Mark Morris Gallery in Los Angeles. Heffernan's paintings have been featured in numerous museum exhibitions, including recently at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, in the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Other museum exhibitions include Tampa Museum of Art, Knoxville Museum of Art, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the New Museum, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, National Academy of Art, and the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. She's a professor of fine art at Montclair State University where she works with MFA students. Ken Johnson said Heffernan, quote, shrugs off orthodoxy to paint the freedom fertility and comedy of her own zany imagination. And Paul Laster in Time Out said Heffernan's, quote, opulent oil paintings recall Renaissance, Baroque, and Rococo masterpieces while imaginatively addressing contemporary concerns. Julie Heffernan has received a McDowell Residency Fellowship, NEA and NIFA grants, and the Thomas Bennett Clark Prize at the National Academy Museum. Kyle Staver attended Camberwell College of Art in London, received her BA from Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and her MFA from Yale. She's had solo exhibitions at Lowen Gedould Gallery, Denise Bibro Fine Art, and Maurice Arlo's Fine Art here in New York, and Hackett Friedman in San Francisco, and John Davis Gallery in Hudson. In 2011, the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design mounted a survey exhibition of her paintings and prints. This past fall, uh, Kyle's, uh, Kyle exhibited recent myth-based paintings at Tibor Denage Gallery, and writing about that show in Hyperallergic, John Yao said, quote, in an age riddled with cynicism and laced with irony, she envisions a shameless alternative in which mythological figures such as Daphne, Andromeda, Syrinx, Perseus, and a satyr are at home. Kyle Staver received a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award and has twice been awarded the Benjamin Altman Figure Prize from the National Academy of Design. So to start this panel, my first question. The three of you create figurative scenes from your imagination rather than observation. You're not setting up costume models in the landscape and then painting the scenes outside. Are your compositions worked out in advance? 
through drawing, Photoshop, smaller painted studies, photo references, or are they discovered while you make the paintings, your artwork changing drastically throughout the process? And when creating an invented scene, do you refer to real places or do you invent the, the setting from scratch? I don't know who wants we'll to go start. In alphabetical order, go ahead. <laughs> um, alphabetical order. The well, ladies first. <laughs> you big baby, come on. Well, it's no fun, right, to, um, to work it out beforehand. So for me, um, I uh, hope and pray for some kind of inchoate image to come to me and that'll start me off, and then it's just kind of a chase um, around to find out what's going to happen around it, what that inchoate image actually needs to be. It'll often be lost in the in the chase. How about you guys? So you have no idea when you begin? Well, just 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 uh, um, vestigially, just uh, just a little like a little shadow. There's a little shadow, so I'll throw a shadow on. Do you do you know? Um, do I know what I'm doing? No, I mean, do you know what, what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I kind of like, yeah, it's a, kind of like a simplified, cheesy metaphor, but I like the idea of the metaphor of, like, the road trip of not knowing where you're going, and it's like this cliche of, like, the dumb painter, but, yes, it's a little bit this intuitive, spontaneous, soul-searching process of you're on the road and you don't know where the next destination is versus here's the photo, and... This is the photo, and now I'm going to transfer this photo exactly on. It's like for me, it's like there's less of a discovery, even though I mean, for me, I like I need to, but I need to discover things as I'm going. I, I need to start with a story, with with um, and 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 go from there. So it's it's sort of a discovery, but but I got a you know I have um, I'm going to Disneyland. I have a destination. To, you know, I want to tell this story. And it's through the painting that you kind of go through the story to something else. But to, but to start um, in the middle of the ocean, um, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. Well, I just I just want to object to the idea that um, uh, taking a road trip is tantamount to being a dumb painter. Because I think of us, and I know that you know, I'm just because uh, I think some people. You know, bet come and pant, you know. Uh, stupid like a painter was oh. the old cliche. And I, I think of, of this as, um, you know, the only kind of pioneering that's available to me because everything's been found in the actual world so I can, I can search in the... In the studio. In the yeah. studio, yeah. So, so we're exploring. So that's intrepid, intrepid's, intrepid mm -hmm. scout leaders. You have more questions for the intrepid well, tree? <laughs> just to bring it back to that first question, so how do you start? Do you throw paint around abstractly and respond, Jules? Do you I mean, work even, from even a drawing? Though a of, even though a lot of my images look like a real set composed, like that painting right there, it looks like a real set thought out composition. But initially, it'll really start with, I'll, I really sometimes have no plan at all. And it's just like, oh, shit, I have a couple months to finish these pieces. And it's, I'll start, and I'll literally just like, oh, I want to work with yellow in this big brush right now. And I'll just like, just kind of like, in this real intuitive, just putting color on the canvas that's not even a set to be a scene yet. And then from there, I'll actually maybe see something. So in a weird way, it's actually like this sort of, I'm responding to whatever primitive crude gestures I put in that first day, and then I come back the next day, and then maybe I'm responding from what I actually can see within that. It's that, <laughs> it's that. So, so essentially, the paintings can start out quite abstractly. Purely abstract, or sometimes I don't know yet what it's going to be. And then within it, I'll see, oh, I see a structure. I'll always sort of go, to, I'll sort of gravitate towards these scenes eventually. But sometimes I'm just starting it really just. And then what happens once you're working on an abstract painting for a while? You, you say. Then there's a point where I decide it's going to go in this direction, or it's going to become a landscape, or a, more a, a, a burst, or a scene, or a crowd of people. But it's really that unplanned a lot of wow. times it really is I don't have I don't I don't have a sketchbook or drawings or anything so it's like I have no archives or evidence it's just my canvases and I have no I have no I have no um, sketches strangely enough and, and Kyle when you say you start out with a story do you mean like a written idea about the um Daphne it's a story it's a myth mm -hmm. um and we all we all know it so that's a starting point. 
and what that may or may not mean um, is part of what the painting mm -hmm. is. But I, 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 I build them. I, I literally build them out of clay. Um, I, I draw them. I make prints of them um, as as I go along. If if the painting if the painting um, seizes up and and won't won't give up or give, I'll move someplace else and and mine there. So when you build them out of clay, is that to like to make a small model of the figures? Well, well it's, you know, it's it's really it's it's important to me in 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 the paintings that the light structure in my invented imaginative painting. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's it's important to me that the that that the light, the sense of light, be kind of equivalent to the light that that I actually experience in 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 this world. Okay, it's not fantastic light. It's not so in building them out of clay. Um, they, even though they're invented forms, they have a light structure that that will then inf can inform me, so that they can keep a toe in in this perceptual world. Wow. And um, are, I, I think when I came to your studio, you told me that your paintings, like Jules, also start very loosely. Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's really um, looking for intelligent patterning that that, that I'm, is what I'm after. Um, I, I don't know if you feel that way, but I see it in your work, so I'm kind of guessing similarly. But it's it's the pattern um, that emerges as you as you intuitively throw things around, move things around, that that really interests me and starts to set up a space, and then once. Um, once I've kind of knitted the space, um, it, it's it's almost like it. Ha well, it's it's the architecture, and so something can then live in it, and that's when the content happens. When it's a, I guess, a livable habitat. So you make a space for the thing to happen. So yeah, I guess that's yeah. that's right. That's a nice. Yeah. That's a nice. Uh... And then there's a change, and you start slowing down and rendering more. And do you ever bring in photo references at that point? Um, sure. There, there's a whole tool chest of things. Um, when I was painting a lot of flowers, I was looking at a lot of photo references of flowers. Um, and uh, yeah, whatever, whatever you need. But the the fir but it's never a priori. It's never the fir It's never. I, I never um, see a photograph and then render it. I'll, I'll have a circle that needs a flower, and that's where it should go. And then I'll look at flower references or real flowers or yeah. But it's usually the structure of the thing that interests me. Can I ask Jules? Yeah, please. Jules, I, I don't know your, your work. So from one painting to another, can they be quite different worlds? Yeah, um, like, um, Chico, do you want to put a slide number 20? Like, I'm sorry. 20, yes. Like slide number 20 was with this last painting in my last show, this, this painting you see here. Was also this was at also the same time that you did the that was in the same show that I just had at Victoria Moreau. These were in the show together. Those colors are totally wrong, but that was <laughs> yeah yeah. Let's <laughs> that was more. so yeah. I can I and so I can and those figures are like eight feet tall. And then that other painting, those little figures are the size of your and they're pinky. So it can really it can shift from that big of a scale. Where there I feel like making an eight foot tall figure, and the other ones, like I said, the the high and low painting that we were just looking at. Or can you look at number slide number 18, Chico? Mm -hmm. It's another sort of similar okay, city view. And that's a tiny little painting of 15 by 19 inches. Mm -hmm. And I like to just shift like that, like have these moments, these nuanced little single hair brushed moments or these big, huge brushes. It's like, these, it's like I think of it like musically almost, like musical notes or like the way I install a show. It can just vary from sizes and heights and placement of paintings as well. So it's not just in this linear grid. It's it's more melodic. Huh. Thanks. But, but Julie, when when you you both say that you you work kind of from the same not knowing, but there's there's a there's a um, a familial recognition in your paintings. Do do you know what I mean? I mean when I see your I I would not know. That, that you did this painting and you did the one before. Do, do you know what I mean? It's called I schizophrenia. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. 
Um, yeah, it's a little, I, my work, I like to be able to just jump from all these different things. Like my shows aren't as like, it's not like a singular theme. Like it's only city scenes, but it's okay. only marching um, refugees in the desert. Or it's, it's, I like to have all these different things that I'm thinking about that I'm bombarded with and kind of take them all in. And then somehow I'm just kind of processing culture, whether it's the stupid stuff on my iPhone or internet and all this, and then how do I process this experience of living in the 21st century visually with all these different information? I'm just not gonna, it's not like only this one idea that I'm interested in. I'm interested in all these, the personal, the political, mm -hmm. and then how do I transmit that on a... So when does subject matter become important to you? It's always important. <laughs> So, so, because you, I, I mean, so you start abstractly. And I start abstractly, but then somehow through some sort of process, I sort of, or once in a while I'll do a, can we do slide number 19 and then you guys can show your oh, work. Oh, this is great. <laughs> I don't know his work. Like this is another, this is like eight feet by 10 or 12 feet, and that's just me trying to make an abstract painting. So that's also in the show with like, one last slide, Chica, yeah. with number 22. That was in the same show as Number 22 is this painting. Those are in the same show together. So I like to be able to. It's liberating for me. So I, I actually want to talk about the, the content behind these images. Um, and I think that that's something that all of you could talk about. Portraits, landscapes, and still lives are not considered narrative genres. While they're based on the world around us, no overt story is being told. But when you invent a scene, when you create a place and you populate it with figures, it is fair to assume that there's a story behind that particular scene being described on the canvas. So my question to you all is, are stories important to you? And how important is it that your paintings deliver that clear story to the viewer? Um, I'm going to tell, I was going to tell the story about going to a museum with a good friend and um, probably the 57th thing on the list that she noticed about the painting was what it was about. Do, do you know uh, the story? And, and the first thing I do when I see a painting is what's, what's the story? What's, what's, what's the story? It's, it's incredibly important to me. But the paintings, even though I start with a story, um, it, somehow they have to they have to transform out of it. Do, you, but there's never there's never a painting I've made where I haven't walked into the studio one day and they're just like so goddamn literal. Do, do you know that that um, it, it's almost unbearable. Like there are illustrations of an idea I have about a story, and the painting it, it has to be painted through. Yeah, I can't avoid it because I want to tell stories. So it's, when you're painting your story, Kyle. You, you can't be illustrative of the story. Is that what I'm, you're I'm not interested in that. The paint has to be the the delivery system. Okay, there, there's lots of delivery systems. You know, we're all we're all painters. We all have different delivery systems. But I need the paint and the light to to be telling you what's going on. Do, do you know if I move this close to you um, in a painting, it means one thing. If this far away, that's a, that's, a, that's a thing that painting can do to deliver what the story is about. D right, there's a million, trillion, zillion things, but it has to be through the paint. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, um, you know, I don't have any trouble with Norman Rockwell, but it's not through the paint. Do, do you know, he's, he's as fun to look at on, on a board like this as he, would, as he is to look at the real painting. There is no, there is no bang for looking at, um, illustrative paintings for me, right. for me. So it's not the story, it's the way the paint works to tell that story. Yeah, to deliver the story. Right. right. And I would say that it's, it's how the, it's the, the space is the delivery system, that, that, that one thing that um, you can play up on the two-dimensional static um, rectangle is foreground, middle ground, background. So where a movie has, you know, this moment behind and this moment in ahead of you, we have, we have space. Um, so w when, um, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking this through right now, but, you know, after I've made the architecture, then it's kind of like the, um, um, the, the, the utilities happen. So, so basically something, 
has to happen in the space, and it usually involves things in the background um, conflating with things in the middle ground, conflating with things in the foreground, creating a, a, an event um, where, like in the last one, that tender trapper one, um, if you want to just go back for one second, um, the, the last what, what one number? that you just had up, um, sure. the one every, uh, this, 43. Yeah, that one, um, the idea is that when the guy pulls the rope, it um, is attached to the branch above, which pulls up the branch below, which pulls the ship over and then waters the turkey ball. Those are a bunch of turkeys. So, so that, you know, that's the idea of what becomes really important to me is you had no after- no idea that you were gonna paint turkey balls? I had no idea, well, I had no idea that I was gonna paint turkey balls, nor that I was gonna paint a pulley system that was fueled by, that was watered by a ship, uh, uh, um, a, a waterlogged ship. So that becomes, it's, and, and that's all happening via what's behind and what's in front, or that can, can happen. Uh, well, actually, my, my friend the, and, and colleague, the painter Simon Carr, at, when, when I was telling him about this panel, he, we, he invents his scenes as well, and we were talking about, he was telling me how important it is to make the, the space feel believable. And uh, is, how do you all deal with that issue of believability in your work? Jules, I, I know when I came to your studio, you were mentioning that you're, you're working to render these images as believably as you can? I mean, as believably as I have patience to, to pursue and to um, stick with, I guess. I mean, I, I, I guess for me, I'm, I am trying to paint it, I mean, sort of realistically, but I'm not holding on to like, to photorealism or anything, or not to any kind of like, um, I'm just giving as much information as I need to without giving too much information or without belaboring it. I like also simplifying it. Or a lot of my paintings are really starting off with just really, it's really basic, primitive, abstract shapes. And it's only at the very last 30% of the painting where it also kind of all of a sudden tightens in and becomes recognizable. A lot of the painting is really just basic shapes. Like I try to get the whole canvas covered as can I, just, can I look at slide 30? It's also my tree in person painting. See, we all have the same ideas. <laughs> but um, like for instance, the stripes in the tree, that was like a, that was just a different, that was me trying to just make an abstract painting with stripes. And then I sort of just, I sort of drew the tree by drawing around the tree. If that makes yeah. any sense, yeah. I drew the space around the tree. Yeah, okay. I just so, but so the figures aren't very realistic, but I don't need to make them that realistic. I like the simplicity of not giving too much information. I just don't have the patience to render that well, and I can't render that well, honestly. I don't. I can't paint figures that patience. that well. Well, like modeling skin and stuff. I can't do that really. <laughs> I have no patience for that. Okay, let's get rid of that one, shall we? Can we go to um, slide 39? Just, I'm sick of looking at it. Just to get another image up there. I was okay. going to put my tree up. I have okay, a tree. Go, go ahead. I have a tree. Go for your tree. tree. Go, go. So, um, uh, Kyle was talking about the difference for her between making the form, the space compelling, and somehow not having it be illustrative. My understanding when I was a student in school was the term illustrative was a shorthand way to describe an artwork where color and shape are secondary to the depicted action when content trumps form. I'd be interested in hearing from all three of you about how you, how you think of that term illustrative. And when working from your imagination, how do you keep the tonal range and the light from becoming schematic how do you keep the formal elements and the narrative description both equally strong? Painting is hard. Here, put, put on her slide 51. Oh. oh, I just want to put my tree. Yeah, they had trees. I want to put my tree. Where's my tree? So, yeah. God, the color is just terrible on this. That's your tree? 
Hey. <laughs> I didn't say that about your tree. <laughs> yeah, That's your tree. Yeah. Well, you know, what I think is interesting, and I'd love to hear from you guys, is that just like Kyle said, there does, and, and a lot of you guys are painters, so I'd be curious, you know, what happens with you guys, but it does seem to be that this illustration stage, or, or um, like, uh, you know, one chapter of it, is horrendously illustrative. And terrifyingly so, like yes. you were describing, yep. and and you know, and you and you as quickly as possible, you know, uh, get, try, try to get no out quick, of it. No but quickly. but what I'm curious is why that stage has to be a part, or maybe that I don't understand why that stage has to be part of it, and yet it always is. Do you, do you remember, do you remember um, Lester Johnson? I remember he, he used to come into my studio and he'd say, you know, if you want to paint a hand, say hand. That's what, I can. It's a flow. No, I mean, L Lester would just say, just paint a hand. And I'd say, well, it's, it's, a, it's a form. No, no, it's a hand. And then, he, then he'd say things like, you have to ask yourself, what kind of hand? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And, it, and everything he said was like, no, no, that's very wrong. You know, you can't do that. Can't do that. But, yeah. but in fact, that's exactly how a painting gets ma made. You, 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 you become more and more um, clear about what it kind of hand you want or tree you want or and and that's how you say good tree bad tree because as you're doing this you you get you think you don't know but you know very well well it, is it fair we have an uh, incredible former illustrator in the crowd is it fair to say that illustration is partially schematic it, at at one okay i shouldn't uh, <laughs> Well, I'm just wondering if the if the illustration phase is is simply another way of saying that that that's the point where the idea is still schematic and not embodied. Uh, sorry. Because we're simulcasting, if it's not in the, if it's not spoken into the microphone, it doesn't get heard. Okay. Okay. So maybe we'll hold questions and conversation till the end, and we'll pass around. Got it. God, I just got caught okay. up in the moment. Too. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> okay. Jules, a number of your invented landscapes look like they could be set in Los Angeles where you grew up. Kyle, before you started painting myths, many of your paintings were memory-based figurative compositions that featured friends and family. And Julie, you've made compositions, uh, deeply personal paintings about your family and your innermost thoughts. When working with personal memories, private thoughts, does that charge your process? Does it engage you more than the political subjects you've tackled? Is there a separation between p political and private? It, it, isn't all painting political? Um, I, you know, I you know I have tried to make paintings initially from um, a st the last show at PPOW. That was my most political show. I wanted to stick it to Exxon Mobil. I wanted to to, to write about cli uh, to paint about climate change. All of that. Um, but with each painting, um, there was a point where it just wasn't fueled enough by, or for what a painting needs, by simply the political screed. It had to, um, I had to re-engage with um, a, a, a world of, with, with some sort of intimacy around it. And Jules, what's the difference for you between making more personal work or more political work, or is it all part um, of the same process? I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess show number, slide number 14 for some people. I mean, for a second, it was 
For a second, I was making work that seemed like overtly political, but I never considered myself a political artist. I mean, this was, I made a couple map paintings, and it was at the time of like 2005, and it was hard not to be, it's like, it's not about being political, it's just about being a sensitive human being, and I was just responding to like everything around me, which was like the war in Iraq, and that whole debacle on September 11th, and all that bullshit. And eventually started taking over my work so much that I actually went to Berlin for a year because I was like, I'm, I was sick of like it becoming so prevalent in my work. And I wasn't, I'm not just, a, I'm not like trying to like, as, I'm, as if I'm really going to start a revolution with my little paintings of like, you know, upside down America. It's so, I sort of, um, I go in and out of making work that's more political or directly like obviously political and then other work that's, some of it's inspired by growing up in California, but I was also lucky enough to have lived a little bit in France and in Spain and in Switzerland. So I have I was constantly like perpetually derooted. I was like the perpetual sort of um, global nomad until I was about in fifth grade. So I was I didn't stay in one school until I was in fifth grade. So it was like my mom was nuts. I love her, but she was nuts, and we were constantly moving. So. I think that's sort of also how I take in images and places and, and having all these sort of different, it's like inundation of images and places and the ease of which I can be in Tokyo tomorrow in 12 hours and just like this constant influx of space and place but, um, just changes that quickly. It doesn't make any sense. But. Well, you, you did mention uh, like when you do the map painting, what, somehow how that painting is received. And Julie, I know you've also made political paintings. Kyle, you've talked about the connection between the personal and the political. And so I, I guess that is a question that I think would be interesting to flesh out a little bit. Uh, when you make these political works, what is is there a hoped for outcome? Is there something that you'd like to accomplish through the painting? Well, I, I've said this a lot, but I'll say it again. You know, you, you say uh, our silly little paintings, and you know, of course. But on the other hand, it's the only um, it's the only megaphone that, that we have. So there's a there's a point where you just say, okay, that's my bully pulpit. I'll use it, and um, and then it starts to seem ridiculous not to. That th th I go into shows where um, somebody isn't y y using their work to speak about what's the most important thing to them, and it just doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you even bother? Um, so um, yeah, so it's it's. It's the, um, the it's the only thing that makes sense at this point. I think maybe I've changed. Or maybe now that I'm older, I think of it differently. Mm -hmm. um, maybe what's happening now in the art world is a CIA inside job again. You think? Maybe. A CIA inside job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know how you're, you're the mole? no, there was a theory that <laughs> during the ABEX it was like it was put on by, by the, the CIA. CIA. Right. This conspiracy theory, right. like it was. Alfred and Bauer I and I think moment. now I'm just I just think it's the irony of what's happening today is there's so much. I mean, it's kind of a re reaction to the work we were doing like 10 years ago, but a lot of the work now is really processed, material-based, um, formal, like navel-gazing abstraction. And, I, and, I, and it's, I think it's so interesting that there's a time where there's so much interesting stuff happening in the world, and meanwhile, the paintings that are happening now, it's like this pure formalist, poetic escapism. It's interesting that it's just, it's so much just about material and form, and it's like that's the narrative of, well, the art market right now and of what's getting played in the art market. But it's also a response to what was happening 10 years ago, which was figurative work. And then right, and what do you do after you do kind of negate that and do the polar opposite, which is what's happening now, which is running its course, but it's been going for a while. But it's, there's some interesting artists in that group, but there's a ton of it that's just bullshit, really, too. You know, But it's interesting to see. Slacker minimalism or crap extraction is what we call it. <laughs> but it's an interesting phenomenon. But it is really happening. Don't you guys agree? Oh, yeah, yeah. We just had a whole dinner party about casualists. Don't worry, I won't. You know, casual, yeah, casual formalism. I'm not, I mean, there's interesting work within it. I'm not saying, but there's a, but it's just a, it's like you go to every gallery in the Lower East Side and it's like a, 
unstretched canvas with staples and a little gesso and some exposed frame. You know, you, know, you cannot, like, you can't it's help. Just a lot of that. You can't help as you get older to start seeing Don't everything. Don't go. What? Don't go. Don't go down there. I mean, stay away. I, Am I really offended? No, 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 it's, it's, why is it so, why is it taking no, you so offensively? No, I'm not offended. I don't really I'm not go, offended by it, but there's, there's just something about. I'm just saying it's not, I don't find it that interesting. That's I think there's, yeah. I think painting is, is a pretty powerful vehicle. Um, I don't know. And I, 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 I somehow don't see it kind of in the arc that you see it. 10 years ago it was this, now it's that. Who knows tomorrow, it's, we're done with that. Let's go here. I, I just don't but track that is, it. That in that is how the market. That is that's, that's the market. That's the that's the market. But or art history too. I mean, well, it's movements or things that happen at certain time periods. It's not just. You know, right. we were having dinner with some Chilean artists the other night, and there's uh, there's it's, it's no visual art for all intents and purposes having happening there, and we were surmising that it's because there aren't rich people to be interested in it. So it's it's very disturbing that the thing we care about so much is fueled by the fact that there's a market. So what he's saying is true, even though it's irrelevant to our love for it. Right. No, it, absolutely. I, I'm sure it's true, but but somehow I thought the panel was going to be about making yes. paintings. Yes. It's, and just about, it's just about painting. It's just yeah. about what's happening. It's not about just this. It's just to open it up. It's, it's okay. Yes. Yes. Well, by, from by all the, means, uh, we'll open it up. I guess maybe we, sh no, we shouldn't talk we politics should. then. No, 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 that's why. <laughs> Why not? It's, it's no, talking I, yeah. about what's so happening. Back to the person. This is all there. nice and proper, but what's happening out there is not this at all. It's not. And it's fine. It's fine. I'm just saying it's just it's just always changing. It's fine. It doesn't affect it hasn't affected me. I'm fine with it. It's just interesting to see the cycles and I'm like wondering like of all things that are happening in the world right now, it's like the work we're making about it's so process material based. And I'm like, really? That's all that's that's the voice, that's the message we have to talk about is like this material against that material and that shape. That's not and all that's going on though. Of course it's not all, but it's, right. it's kind of a bigger general thing. It's, it's kind of the prevalent thing of... Well, of, it's not my place to interject my opinion. Okay. But, do, do, do. <laughs> but... Uh, we'll get this at dinner. The emphatically we'll handmade, I think, was a term that Thomas Michiele used to describe a recent show in Williamsburg. And I think that there is something in an age of mass production, political, about the handmade, the aesthetically handmade. Well, and this isn't handmade? It is. <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. I, I got the sense yeah. that what, what Jules this? was drawing a distinction between um, some kind of formalist handmade approach and uh, you know, the bigger issues that are out there. And I was saying that, in my view, there is something, um, that there's a, there's there's a political contact content behind making something very handmade. That, in and of itself, I it's think, is political. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to you, though. Considering that these images are personal inventions, are you concerned with how your paintings connect to viewers who don't know you or the background behind your images? Sorry, I, I was, I'm sorry, I spaced uh, out. So, in other words, when you're, when you're painting a personal story, do you think about, does somebody need to know that story to enjoy the painting? Is it a formal enjoyment? How, what's the reception? Yeah. Oh, yeah, is it? Go ahead. Um, yeah, can you go on slide 28? For me, it's not necessarily so much about a direct, set, clear narrative. Like, this was for an exhibition that was on the theme of disaster, and I, at the same time, I didn't want to do a blood and guts apocalypse, so I kind of wanted to sort of leave it, they're sort of watching this, this disaster, but it could go either. I like, I like when things have a potential to sway it. They're on this fine line of, it can go in either a sort of utopian or dystopian direction, where they have this potential like these. There's, I like it when it can, teeter on either, it can, it can fall into either realm where it's not necessarily, I don't have a set clear narrative like, like a lot of like David Lynch movies and that's what I like. I think there's like an eeriness to the unexplainable or to like the silence before the storm. Like a lot of his movies you don't necessarily, 
it's just a shot of a hallway and there's just a shadow and it's scarier than anything and without a set real narrative in some of his films anyways can you go to slide 36 and uh, I'm, I'm only bringing this one up because it was one of the few times that the bottom of it was painted um, after Sandy, and that's, I think, rock, the rock, Rockaways, the landscape below. So do I care if anybody knows that? Um, no. Just no. It's a starting point for you. It's a starting point, yeah. 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 I mean, I think if I think if the content is de it's dependent on the wall text, then you've you, you know you've lost something. Right? Say that again. If if no if if entering the painting is dependent on what you read in the wall text, then you've you've lost something. You mean the, in the story? If you in, in the paint, yeah, it, it, yeah. That it doesn't really matter for the success of the painting that you know that that's the Rockaways. But if you do know it's the Rockaways and you're already in the painting, I get it. then I get um, it. maybe yeah. you're in even a little more. Okay, I get it. So, it enhances. When I was talking to Catherine Bradford about this panel a couple of weeks ago, she said that when she invents a figurative scene, she has strategies to get in the zone. And she said what she wanted to hear from you three were your strategies to get in the zone. Do you need to be in a special headspace to invent these scenes? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? I, uh, the, you know, it's just like pound. It's like mining. You know, tap 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 tap. And you you just kind of go go through the painting. Painting is like well, no, there is a point where you link up. I mean, you know, I I will go to, up to the studio with my you know my whatever my muffin. And I'll look at the painting. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, get on my comf comfortable couch, which is very important. Everybody who's an artist Com must yeah. have a comfortable couch. And um, and I'll, you know, I'll just start doing the mental inventory of what the painting needs, and then and with no urge to actually go and do it. And then suddenly you're just linked in. And Bob Yarber used to talk about um, homunculi that would uh, that would fly back and forth between the artist and the painting. Like there was actually like a little little um, little beings, you know, uh, emanating from the artist in the painting, and and that always made so much sense to me because it starts to feel that way that I'm. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, that, that's great. Is that yeah? Oh, yeah. Does that happen for you? There's um. There's a funny. <laughs> oh, I was getting thinking. Um, there's a funny thing that. It, that happens when when one is painting. That that you can say, um, you can be sitting in your comfy couch and you can look at your your painting and say, I'm going to go and work on that left hand corner. And then corner before you know it, you're working on the right hand corner. You, you, you cross that no man's land yeah. between comfy couch and whatever, and your brain goes somewhere, and you're down there. You're okay, wait, wait, wait. There. I have something really interesting okay. that, that, that I don't understand, and then you can talk. No, I'm listening. You have, <laughs> right. listening. Do you okay. have comfy <laughs> couches and funny <laughs> little um, the, 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 This is the phenomenon that interests me so much, and I want somebody to explain it. Okay, so you, um, you're, you're, you're stuck at a point in the painting. You're stuck, and you go through the m mental inventory of what you can do, and none of it quite works, and so you get exhausted, and you, you know, conk out or something. <laughs> And then, and then you get up and you, 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 you know what you have to do. It's some combination of the mental inventory that you've just gone through. And you, you head off to do it. And before you know it, you, you just, you're, you're doing something completely different that was actually the better answer. So it's like you get what you, th what you, what you think to be the epiphany. That's the answer. And then it turns out that there's, in just lunging at the canvas, that it's really over there. And it's like, what is that? It's like epiphany within epiphany that you didn't even know about. And it's so real. It's so you know that it's right. And I, 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 I we need neurobiologists to explain this. To oh, yeah, that's does, right. does this Yes, guys? no, it's absolutely true. Is that true for you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, talk about the trip across from comfy couch to painting. Um, um, I live and work in the same space, so there's like, it's just, and I, all I have to do is take care of my cats and make paintings. So it's really, I know that sounds like oh, it's it's a bratish of me to say that, but it's like 
that's my only responsibilities, and sometimes it can be hard just to um, to just to create my own structure and have some kind of structure and have a normal life and um, just have it be like a normal life. This isn't but, a normal life. No, um, I guess I just struggle with like having no structure and just I just have to I just have to make paintings by a certain date and that's all I have to do and and sometimes I struggle with just having too much time and not enough restrictions in a, way, a weird way or creating my own creating my own discipline is hard if I had a wife or kids or I just have plants and cats so that keeps like some structure you know, but it's true it's a struggle of like the structure and then like no, the having my bed above and my studio below is like the problem for painters is they make the whole thing up they make all this shit up to, to know there are no rules um, so it is hard well, then there's the question of what has to be made. And that's awful. That, I mean, that, that's so hard. But that's really what it's about. Can you, what do you mean by that? What, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm going to put something in the tree. What, what needs to be in the tree? What have I never seen in the tree? What is a natural um, sprouting of the tree? What, you, what, what that is, is some kind of like, you know, romantic idea of truth you know it I mean it has that kind of of, um, of profundity to it potential but but the every the, whenever I finally decide what's in the tree it's never profound it doesn't it never the question is profound but the answer is never does never feels like it's achieved the profundity of the question okay because um, the next question I wanted to ask is actually inspired by uh, our conversation um, in your studio. Uh, how do you convey a worldview when you're depicting imaginary scenes? Is it necessary to use symbolism? And if so, is the meaning of those symbols planned ahead of time, or is it something that you discover in your own work afterward? Are you asking me? I'm asking the three of you. You know, I took a, an early Netherlandish painting class, and it, it, when you look at Netherlandish paintings, there's like a million things. Should I, wait? I just want you to, okay. There, there are a million things in them, and um, Panofsky says that... Panofsky, please. <laughs> Panofsky um, was saying that, that at the time that these paintings were made, everyone knew what these objects meant, okay? And we've lost the ability to decode them, okay? So we're, we're looking at the, and we think, well, why is that there? What's, what is that? But they're, they're very specific things. Um, and they, they had meaning, and, and everyone knew how to decode them when they were made. We've just lost the key. Um, the things in my paintings, uh, if, if there's an, um, a group of animals, they usually operate as a chorus. Then, and I have a chorus of animals in a painting to cue you, just the same way a Shakespeare play has a chorus to tell you when you're in trouble or when, wait, you know what, put up, um, what have I got? Where's my chorus? Oh, here's a chorus. Put up 49. I got lots of choruses. Um, no, 49? 49. So, so the the fish are, are, you know, objects, and and their job in the painting. Can you hear me? No. Oh, shit. Um, and their job in the painting is to um, reinforce the drama of the of the painting, so you, you don't get lost. Um, what well, is it? Can you elaborate? What do you don't get lost? Woo! They've got, they've got, ah! It, the, right, she's making the universal oh my god gesture, right? Um, the fish are singing in different, you know, different openings. Of, uh, whoa! So uh, you get an idea that there's something going on even though it's underwater and completely silent. Um, so everything that, everything that I put in a painting has to do a job. You know, it's not, it's not, I don't think of them as decorative. I don't, I think of them as, I, I say this again and again, delivery systems, you know, uh, for what, the story, the, the meaning. 
Uh, your turn. Um, well, uh, yes, it's true that you know, dog doesn't mean faithful, you know, as it, or whatever it meant. Um, but dog certainly does mean something to us. And dog, in conjunction with um, candy cane, um, might mean something else. Uh, you know, meaning it, it, it's the relationship. It, uh, that, that, that it's, I think, compound um, symbols are are interesting to play with in within a context that they can be decoded according to um, our sociocultural system. Um, I wouldn't expect somebody from you know any place right. other than you know Western European maybe, but but then maybe I maybe I would. Um, I don't know. You know, does a garden hose mean anything to somebody in the Maldives? You know, I don't know. And does it mean something to you when you choose to paint it, or is it some, or is the meaning discovered after you've made the the image? Um, that the, I think uh, um, most of the choices, the specific choices, come first out of a formal need that that tree um, was too warm and I needed to cool it down, and and at the same time I needed her to have a mechanism for um, cooling down the fire in the tree. And the garden hose um, also functioned as a vine. So um, I guess that's maybe that's it, that, that a symbol has to have at least three functions. Let's more, just more say loosely. You know. Bang for your buck. Yeah. Slide 16 for me. Yeah, I, I think for me as well, I mean, I think, I mean, everything is a sign and a signify. I mean, everything has, is, represents something and also can say They're signifies. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'm not like overtly like thinking of symbolism in painting, but everything sort of is a sign and has a signifier. Like, for instance, in this painting, Boys Club, in the background are these other, the paintings within the paintings kind of, to me, signify like the, 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 the precursor or the, the hierarchy that was before this boy club or the cyclical sort of the old patriarchy or, the, or the, the, the predecessors that were there before and the fireplace, the mantle is sort of like signifying this typical sort of like Yale, Wall Street, boys club kind of bullshit that I wanted to sort of just capture in this, in this room. So yeah, the, the, those, those paintings in a sense are symbols or signifiers for previous or past, or the cyclicals of history. OK, thank you. Um, so speaking of history, Kyle and Julie, your artwork connects to the art of the past through technique and subject matter, most obviously, to the present day. But Jules, after visiting your studio, I was struck by how your paintings didn't seem overly concerned with their place in art history. Your artwork seemed unburdened by this concern, content to be part of the world today. Though you may reference Matisse in a painting, it feels like your artistic aims are very different from his. Bearing in mind that historians differ on the definition of modernism, Bernard Smith, writing in Modernism's History, a study in 20th century art and ideas, says, quote, modernisms are critiques of modernity. They draw upon the archaic, the classic, the exotic, and the primitive to develop their critiques. Modernism does not feel at home in modernity. Its, draw, its creative drive is constructed from components drawn from an idealized past or a utopianized future not from modernity's present, which it finds banal or life-threatening, end quote. Jules has painted failed utopian scenes, while Julie's and Kyle's landscapes at times look like gardens of Eden. Does the panel agree with the definition of modernism and the distinction I'm drawing? In other words, is Jules at home in modernity and you two are not at home in modernity? No. I mean, yes, you're at home in modernity. You can be home, but <laughs> we're all home in modernity. <laughs> I'm a painter and in in painting now, right? Isn't that? Well, I mean, I, I definitely feel the that there is more a, 
a consideration in Julie's and Kyle's work to place yourselves in a, in a timeline and to relate today to the, the history of painting. And this is not a criticism, it's an no, observation. No, no, no. When I was visiting Jules's studio, it didn't seem like that concern, that, that sense of continuity with the past weighed on you. Uh, I, I don't, if it's an unfair question, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing why, and if you think it's an interesting question or it's something that you think is relevant to your work, I'd be interested in hearing about that too. Um, well, I, I, I certainly, um, you know, one of the things that's kind of wonderful about painting now is that, uh, it, you know, we've run through the gamut of styles that, that kind of typified a um, late modernism, a kind of a, a lost modernism um, that I grew up in in the 70s. Um, so I could choose just what I thought was were powerful tropes, rhetorical, you know, rhetorical um, choices of styles, essentially. I mean, when, you know, when I started to notice images in my head, I wanted to basically be able to paint light and shadow so that I could make them clear. So I wasn't really thinking of the burden of art history or even referencing art history. Um, I was thinking of just the way I see you in light and shadow is the way I saw these images in light and shadow and the way I wanted to paint in light and shadow. So it really was, you know, not, not, but then when I started to, um, uh, learn more about art history and and um, realize that that the, the the reason that that particular light and shadow approach was used for so long is because it's very sensorial, and my experience in my head is sensorial. So I wanted them to be um, you know co co coincident. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't think of it as a burden of art history. I think of it as, as as a continuum. And now you know we pick and choose. And I have moments in my paintings that are very flat when I want to reference. You know something that has meaning through flatness, etc. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very much. A, I mean, I'm very much a, aware of art history, but it's not so much. I'm not thinking about it so much when I'm painting directly. I mean, I'm more just. Um, and I mean, I have my painting heroes that I look up to, but I'm. I'm, I don't know how to answer that question. Do you see that distinction? I mean, do you think it's accurate? The distinction between modern, mod, so I don't even know what's complicated between modernism. feeling like I, that, uh, that it's important for Julie and Kyle to connect their work to, for example, in the stag painting, perhaps a painting by Courbet. Um, or, yeah, uh, no, it's a love letter to Courbet. A, Okay, so, or in Julie's paintings, you know, the technique is, is maybe inspired by Fragonard, perhaps. And it, that's a difference. And I, I was just wondering how you guys respond to that. And is it just a, a difference in temperament? Well, I mean, for one thing, I, I, know, I know for me, on my personal experience, I think part of the way I learned painting is I actually studied ceramics. So I didn't study painting. So the way I learned to make paintings was sort of my own weird blotched ceramic painting way. So part of it maybe is, that's maybe why it's, you don't see it like as obviously linked. I mean, that's obviously a reference to Matisse. But um, yeah, I didn't study painting, I studied ceramics. So I think that was sort of like, I developed my own sort of basic shape building, like basic forms and shapes to build a picture that I was using when I was painting on clay. Well, those are the 10 questions I have. <laughs> Thank you very much.